Hello! Welcome to another episode of the R6RS uh, Scheme Report Training Arc. I don't remember which part we're in. Part 4, maybe? Anyway, um, I would like to respond in this video to a very good question uh, that was asked on the video about what does it mean to be properly tail recursive? If you remember previously when we were reading the report, there were all these mentions of scheme being properly tail recursive or handling tail calls properly or whatever. Okay. We can look up the exact phrase, but you know, why say properly tail recursive? Why not just say tail recursive? And this is a good question. And the short answer is, I don't know. I don't, I've always been a little confused by this. And beyond that, you know, originally I thought the notion of tail recursive was some sort of runtime property, but you can tell statically if a program and scheme is tail recursive. That is a syntactic property. You can look at the syntax and the, the report actually describes exactly what it means syntactically for a program to be um, tail recursive or whatever. So we'll, we'll look at the exact language. We'll try to be precise. We'll try to understand exactly what's going on there. But I think this is an interesting question. What does it mean? And, and, we, and we need to look at exactly what the, what the language is. One thing I'll say is that when you're dealing with things like language specifications or definitions or semantics, the terminology is important. So let's find out exactly what the terminology is. Let's see if this is described formally or informally in the spec, we can also look at the Shea scheme program, or sorry, the scheme programming language by Divig. See if he talks about it. And also I found this paper um, by Will Klinger on, whoops, on proper tail recursion and space efficiency. So um, this paper seems to talk about those issues. Um, I'm not even sure how long, uh, how old this paper is. Let's see. What does it say? It looks old. 1998. SIGPLAN 98. Mm, I don't know what this is. This is, is uh, SIGPLAN is a special interest group on programming languages as part of the ACM, Association for Computing Machinery. So this could be ICFP or it could be POPL. I don't know. Or something like that. I'm not sure which one. It is, so whatever is in Montreal in 98. Um, okay, so uh, we can look at this paper that talks about this issue. How long is this paper? This paper is uh, like 10, 11 pages. Uh, we don't have to read the whole paper, although you know, I guess how, how deep do we want to go in a rabbit hole for an aside? Um, if we really can't find an answer, maybe we have to go into the paper a little bit. Hmm. All right. That might be interesting. Um, might be interesting to at least skim the paper and see if it's worth uh, kind of getting into more because I, I would like to understand this issue more. So thank you for your question. I think this is exactly the, the reason I'm making these videos is uh, to, you know, try to fill in the gaps that I have in my understanding. Let's just, uh, let's see. So let's see download this. Sure. And then open it up. Uh, how do I do this? Uh, open it up. Oops. Yeah, no, oops. I did it right the first time. All right, here is the report. And let's try, first of all, let's look for the word proper. Okay, so the first time in our six report, we see scheme is a statically scoped and properly tail recursive dialect of Lisp. Okay, properly tail recursive. Oh, here we go. Semantic concepts, section five of the report, page 20, proper tail recursion, section 5.11. All right, well, let's just click on that. Now we're jumping ahead, obviously, in the report, but I think this is, um, oh, wow, it's really short. Well, let's just go ahead and read it and see see if that makes sense to us. 
And maybe there's some other description of this. Section 5.11, proper tail recursion. Implementations of scheme must, this is must, this is a, uh, implementations must do this. This is important. Must be properly tail recursive. Procedure calls that occur in certain syntactic contexts called tail contexts are tail calls. Okay, so anything in italics, that's a formal definition. Okay, so these are technical terms. So we, in two sentences, we've got three technical terms defined properly or introduced. Properly tail recursive, tail contexts, which is a syntactic uh, concept, and, and tail calls. Okay, so those are the three technical terms. A scheme implementation is properly tail recursive if it supports an unbounded number of active tail calls. A call is active, okay, that's a fourth technical um, term introduced in this paragraph. A call is active if the called procedure may still return. Note that this includes regular returns as well as returns through continuations captured earlier by call with current continuation that are later invoked. Interesting, okay, so, hmm. So the, there's a, a tail call and tail context, but there's this idea of an active call and the active call can be involved with call CC and whether or not you can return from that call from the continuation you grabbed sounds like so that is a subtlety i don't remember uh okay so that that is interesting in the absence of captured continuations calls could return at most once and the active calls would be those that had not yet returned a formal definition of proper tail recursion can be found in Klinger's paper five. Oh, i bet you that's the paper found the rules for identifying tail calls in constructs from, R, from the RNRS base 6 library are described in section 11.20. Okay, so we have a, a pointer to Klinger's paper, which I'm pretty sure is the paper I found. Let's click on that. Proper tail recursion and space efficiency. Uh, proceedings of the 1998 Conference on Programming Language Design and Imp Implementation. Okay, this is PLDI. Uh, just to give you some background, there are four big ACM SIG plan conferences every year, at least historically. Um, so there's PLDI, I mean, historically meaning sort of relatively recent history. There's PLDI, Programming Language Design and Implementation. There's OOPSLA slash SPLASH, which used to be object-oriented programming, but now is more general. Uh, then there's uh, ICFP, International Conference on Functional Programming. That's the one I try to go to. That's where scheme workshops usually co-located. Many canon workshops normally co-located there. Um, and then there's POPL, Principles of Programming Languages. So those are, those are like the four big ones for sort of academic programming languages. Uh, now, if you do supercomputing, that's different. There is a conference called Supercomputing, and that will talk about languages. But in terms of language design, language implementation, language semantics, it's those four. Okay, so this is PLDI, and PLDI historically has focused very much on implementation, performance, benchmarks, those sorts of things. So, you know, sort of the phrase is, you know, if you want, want a PLDI paper, you better have benchmarks. Maybe not entirely true, but that's kind of the idea. If uh, if you want to have a popple paper, principles of pro programming languages, you should probably have a semantics and a proof of correctness, that kind of thing. So once again, th these aren't 100% accurate, but that gives you some idea. If you go to popple, you're going to see a lot of semantics and a lot of proofs, uh, a lot of mechanized meta theory. If you go to PLDI, you're going to see a lot of benchmarks and discussion of performance and optimizations and things like that. So this is a PLDI paper from 1998. Okay. So that's the Wilklinger paper that talks about. So interestingly, the report says, okay, go read this paper if you actually really want to know what a proper tail call is. 
Um, and it gives that paper gives a formal definition. So the report doesn't seem to give a formal definition, as far as I can tell. The rules for identifying tail calls and constructs from the base library. Okay, so this little syntax, by the way, is used to say that, okay, we're going to have a library that contains the base parts of the R6RS. And notice the way it's written. It's a little weird. It says RNRS. Okay, it doesn't say R6RS. It says RNRS, base, and then six. So I guess six this means the sixth version. And so this is the, you know, R to the N power, uh, like R5, RS, R6, RS. Uh, the idea is, okay, well, you know, let's just have a number that sort of parameterizes over this instead of having a separate R6, RS uh, base or uh, so forth. Some people didn't like the fact that R6, RS introduced this this name, they thought, hey, that's not really yours to take for all future versions of Scheme. I don't know. Probably, probably not that critical. Um, okay, and then the rules for identifying tail calls and constructs from the li you know this library are described in this section. Okay, so interestingly, the rules for identifying tail calls depend on the constructs. That's a syntactic notion. So it depends on what sort of syntax you have in the language, what sorts of expressions and so forth. So you can't just say what a tail call is. You have to say, well, what, what part of scheme are you talking about or which extensions to scheme? So if I introduce new macros and new syntax, um, the, the notion of what, what it means to have a tail call could change because of my new, my new syntax. So you'd have to be aware that I've introduced new syntax to scheme. So that's why they're saying, okay, here are the rules for the base part of R6RS. Okay, if they're, if they're extensions or maybe library syntax, then <clears throat> you might have to extend this notion or modify it. Okay, so let's see here. Go to 11.20, tail calls and um, tail context. See how long this is, okay. Hmm. All right, it's kind of hanging out in space here. Uh, it's kind of un some unfortunate page breaks here. After after writing some books with Dan Friedman, I'm acutely aware of things like the white space on pages. Okay, well, let's just go ahead and read this. All right. I said I was going to read the whole spec. I didn't say I'd read it in order. I don't think I did. Um, I mean, we might read this again sometime in the future, but... Let's try to figure out what is what's described here. Okay, tail calls and tail contexts. A tail call, remember, it's italicized, so that's a technical term, is a procedure call that occurs in a tail context, technical term. Tail contexts are defined inductively. Okay, inductive definitions, like from math, this is, if you're not familiar with that, think recursion. Okay, so it's sort of like a recursive definition. Note that a tail context is always determined with respect to a particular lambda expression. All right. All right. Here, here are the bullet points describing the tail context. What is a tail context? The last expression within the body of a lambda expression, shown as tail expression below, occurs in tail context. All right. Well, let me, let me open this up. Let me open up a uh, Shea here. Maybe we can kind of play along, which is the really the whole point of this. So, dun, dun, dun. all right, the last expression within the body of a lambda expression. Okay, so <clears throat> we can have a lambda expression. Okay. And within the lambda expression, we can have things like, you know, printf. I know printf's maybe. <laughs> okay, let, let me try to do something that's uh, part of the R6 RS. I don't think printf is part. Um, display hello. Okay, new line. And then we're going to return uh, plus xy. 
All right. All right. So that's uh, a lambda expression, and of course we can, you know, call. We can make a procedure call to the procedure that results from evaluating that lambda expression, and maybe I want to pass in three, four, four, five, six. Okay. So we see the side effect or effect of displaying hello and the output. I'm sorry, the new line. And then we also see the value of the lambda expression, which is the value of the last expression within the body of the lambda. And I talked about this in another video with the, with the macros stuff, but I'll just point out that in Scheme, there's a, a form called begin. So begin is for sequencing things. So I could take this display new line, you know, I could paste this into a begin. So here I will, um, let me say we're gonna add four and five, okay? And the idea here is this allows me to sequence um, more than one thing. And normally you would do that because you want to have some sort of side effect, like a mutation, like a set bang or, or a set car bang or something like that. Um, or maybe reading, you know, uh, the, there are various things you might do, um, but the value of the begin is going to be the value of the last expression within the begin. Okay, so the value of this expression will be uh, the value of plus four five. All right. Whenever you see a lambda, that lambda expression implicitly has a begin in it. Okay, so. Uh, often you'll only have have one expression in the body of the lambda, right? So we could just have a lambda that looks like that. And that's sort of the traditional functional um, programming lambda. But just be aware that the meaning of a lambda that has um, multiple expressions in it, I'm fumbling with my Emacs, is going to be you know, like there's these begin type semantics. All right, so it's, it's like that. Um, okay, so that's why it's talking about, in uh, the report, it's talking about the last expression within the body of a lambda is, you know, that's in tail position. So that's what it's talking about. So the last expression within the body of a lambda expression shown as, and then here we got these kind of brackety things, uh, okay, shown as tail expressions. So that's how, how in the report they write, you know, like kind of formally what a tail expression looks like in the syntax below occurs in tail context. Okay, so this is what's in tail context. I'm used to saying tail position, but tail context is the technical term, apparently, according to the report. Okay, great. Okay, so that's the first definition. And so, um, okay, so here we have some, you know, sort of like formal syntactic uh, example. So I'm giving a specific example here, but, you know, uh, in the report, you actually see something like this. So. Now, what I didn't say, I'm like, okay, let me show you some uh, a more complicated lambda. Okay, so I said it just looks like the begin, but, um, and and we'll learn from the report when we go through. So I, I don't think what I said is exactly right as far as the begin. Uh, I think it's more complicated than that. So a lambda has formals, and I'll show you what those look like very quickly. And then has the star means zero more, zero more definitions, then zero more expressions followed by a required tail expression. Okay, so if it if the expression doesn't have a star at the end, that means it's got to be got to be there. Okay, there's exactly one tail expression. There's zero more expressions before it, zero more definitions before it, and the formals. Okay, well the formals for a lambda, these are like the arguments. Uh, formal parameters, they can take several different forms. So that's why 
it's written um, like that. So let's just talk about the formals. So you can have, you know, kind of the, you can have a Lambda with no arguments. So here's the body, blah, blah, blah. You can have a Lambda with, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever, however, however number of arguments you want. You, you can't repeat the names, okay? Those, the parameter names have to be unique. And I can't like write five or something like that. It's gotta be an identifier or syntactically there are restrictions, okay? Um, may, maybe I should be careful of the word identifier, okay? We, we should go through the port and see exactly what it says. But this is kind of like an informal understanding. Um, but there are also some other ways to write things. So, you know, we might be used to kind of like writing that, but there's also this kind of thing. So you can have a dot in the list of um, parameters, a list of formals. You can have a dot in, at the end of that list and then have one, one name or one identifier or one variable um, name after the dot. And so uh, this is sometimes called a rest argument or uh, like a var args argument. The idea is that if you call the resulting procedure, you have to give that procedure at least three arguments. And if you give more than three arguments, the remaining arguments will be packaged up into a list, in this case called rest, that we could then refer to. Okay, so this allows us to write a procedure that takes a variable number of arguments where the additional arguments get packaged up. If we want, you know, so, but here you have to give this procedure, the procedure that results from the Lambda, at least three arguments. So let me, let me just show this to make it more concrete. So let's do X, Y, Z, rest. We'll just put those in our list, okay? And so let me call that, um, the procedure we get back from evaluating that Lambda. Let me give it some arguments. Like I'll say um, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so you see that we get back a list. So the X is going to be a three, Y is going to be four, Z, Z is five, and then rest is going to be the list of six, seven, eight. Those are the additional arguments. Those are the var args. Now, what if we want the procedure to take any number of arguments? Well. Then we could just write down something like this. Okay, like args. It doesn't matter. The name, you know, it doesn't have to be rest. It doesn't have to be args. You could do whatever you want. But th this will allow um, the resulting procedure to take any number of arguments at all. And then there we go. Now notice that when we do this, the result comes back as a list. So, if I wanted to, I could define a function called my list, which is lambda args, or let, actually let's do it the shorthand, lambda xx, okay? And so if I call my list um, plus three, four <clears throat> times four, five, quote cat, hash f, what do I get back? I call my list with a bunch of expressions, I get back a list of the results of the evaluation of those expressions. Well, my list is also, you could just call that list. So that is how you can define list in scheme. So list is basically just lambda xx, right? Cool. So as soon as you have that var args mechanism, you can use that to define list. Uh, Ziz Gulum showed me that. I was like, whoa, I didn't realize that, that's cool. All right, <clears throat> so anyway, um, so I was showing you before that you could have multiple expressions that you could use for side effects, let's say like printing or doing a set bang mutation. And then you have this last expression, that's a tail expression, tail context, but you can also have definitions. So let's see if I can uh, do an example of that. Okay, so here's where we go. Here's where we were before, where I had a lambda and I had, you know, these would be the expression stars. Okay, so this would this would fit in the expression star part of the formal syntax right here. Uh, both of these 
Okay. And then this last one would be, this would be the tail expression. Okay. Um, so that's fine. And that works. But notice we can also have zero more definitions. All right. So uh, I'm allowed to do things like this. I can have a, a local define or enter define. Uh, you know, I could say define, um, I don't know, w to be y plus z. Okay. And then I could say I'm going to add w to y. That's okay. So I'm allowed to do that. I can have definitions inside of the lambda as well. Um, I don't believe you can have definitions inside of a begin. Let's see if that, yeah. See, we get, an, oh, actually, no. No, 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 let me be careful. We, uh, the problem there was we were referencing the Y and the Z. Um, so maybe we can have a define. Okay, so let's see, we're using y uh, y and z so let me make these uh top level uh, y be uh, one and z be two okay let's try the begin again oh yeah all right work work just fine i don't know if that was a change from r5 i i think uh so, some of these expression forms or sequencing forms, I should say, I think are a little more general in R6 than they were in R5. I don't remember if, if you could do that in R5 or if it was defined in all implementations, but you can do that in R6. Cool. So I guess it is just a begin or the equivalent of an implicit begin in the body of a Lambda. After all, the report should talk about these things. Okay. But, uh, all right. So just going back to the syntax, that's uh, that's what the syntax is for a lambda, as in to, you know, that last expression, which is required, is the uh, tail expression or the expression in tail context. And let's just make sure that <clears throat> Shay is doing it right. So I can have a lambda, uh, lambda x, you know, that returns five, that's fine. But what if I don't have an expression? at all inside of uh, the body of the Lambda invalid syntax. Okay, great. That's exactly what we thought. See that there's no star after the tail expression. So that is required. You have to have at least one expression in the Lambda. Okay. So that's what's going on here with this thing. And, and that's the base definition. So when we think of, of tail, um, tail context, we really think of lambda. So this, this last position for an expression in a lambda, you know, that is sort of the canonical notion of, of tail context or tail position, sometimes it's called. Okay, so for a lambda, we now know which expression is in tail uh, context. That means, by the way, that the other expressions are not in tail context. So if we go back to the example we were using, okay, something like uh, with the lambda. All right, here's our lambda. So uh, instead of doing a new line, I'm allowed to do something like multiply three by four. Okay, so there's there are no side effects here. What's going to happen is, you know, uh, whatever value of multiplying three by four will be discarded, or maybe the compiler can figure out that there's no effect here and just you know, not even evaluate this, like, you know, compile it away. Um, but in any case, <clears throat> we're never going to see 12 as a result of calling the procedure we get back from evaluating this lambda expression. So that's just not, not relevant. Uh, but the important thing is this is, th that expression times 3, 4 is not a tail expression. Okay. That's not a tail expression. Um, and, okay, so that's a syntactic quantity or a syntactic concept. But the other way to think about it is after this expression is evaluated and you know the value of the expression is 12, is there still work that needs to be done to figure out the value of the lambda expression? And yes, there is. You still have to do this addition. 
Okay, so knowing the value of three times four doesn't tell you the value of the entire lambda, but knowing the value of w plus y does tell you the value of the lambda expression. That's the last thing that has to happen. Okay, so that's another way sort of informally to think about it. And this is tied to notions of things like continuations. Okay, all right. So we know what is in tail, uh, we know what a tail expression is for lambda. We know it's not a tail expression, what, what isn't in tail context. Okay, and the definitions also aren't in tail context. All right, moving on. If one of the following expressions is in tail context, then the sub-expression shown as tail expression are in a tail context. These were derived from specifications of the syntax of the forms described in this chapter by replacing some occurrences of expression with tail expression. Only those rules that contain tail context are shown here. All right, there's actually a fair amount to unpack in that paragraph. This is the sort of paragraph that, you know, sort of drove me up the wall initially when I was trying to read this. I was like, what is this talking about? Um, I don't think it's that complicated, actually. So we'll just do some examples here. I don't know, maybe other people uh, find it more obvious. But when I was trying to read um, the R5 report, I would get tripped up on a lot of this. Okay, only those rules that contain tail context are shown here. Okay, so there, there are a couple important things. So they're gonna give rules below uh, for expressions or forms that have you know, uh, tail context. And if there isn't any tail context for that that form, they just don't show it, okay? So, so if you don't see uh, in this list, one of the R6R or R and RS, uh, you know, version six base library forms listed here in this section, then you know that it doesn't have any sort of tail context. It doesn't have any um, uh, tail expressions. Okay, so that's the first thing. So if it's omitted, then there is no tail context. Uh, this uh, sentence, these were derived from specifications of the syntax of the forms described in this chapter by replacing some occurrences of expression with tail expression. Okay, so I think what that means is this chapter, you know, we're in chapter five, right? Uh, no, we're in chapter 11. Sorry, we were in chapter five. Now we're in chapter 11. So chapter 11 is is showing different types of expressions and forms and things like that. Um, and it's going to include syntax. So let's see if we can find an example of some syntax here that has expression in it. Um, okay. Oh man, so much stuff here. 11.7, wow, this chapter is long. Okay, well here we have conditionals. So I think I think we'll we'll be able to do, do something with conditionals. All right, so let's look at if. All right, so here we have, there are actually two versions of if in scheme. Um, okay. Test, consequent, and alternate, alternate must be expressions. Okay, so they wrote it as test consequent and alternate. You know, um, that's sort of how schemers think of it. But this really is if expression, expression, expression. That would be the other way to write this. Um, and it turns out this expression and this expression are in tail context. Those are both tail tail context. Um, the the test expression is not in tail context. So. Uh, these aren't literally written as expression, expression, um, and replace with uh, tail expression, but but these are the types of these are expressions. So, okay, that the the terminology is a little a little annoying. Um, see if there's another. Okay, cond is a complicated. I don't want to get into cond. Mm. How about let? 
Oh, they got body. Okay. So some of these are kind of complicated. I mean, they're not super complicated, but you have to know what a body is, okay? And the body, like I said, you know, has this sort of implicit begin in it. So, you know, you have to kind of read these things uh, carefully and you have to kind of understand what it means by an expression or just read the spec and says, okay, test is an expression, alternate is an expression. Um, all right, well, anyway, let's just go back to our rules. Uh, where were we? Uh, proper tail recursion, and then let's go to 11.20 again. Okay. So anyway, uh, so this syntax came, the syntax below in this bullet point came from earlier in this chapter, in chapter 11, that introduces the syntax uh, from the base R6RS language. So, uh, but some of the expressions they replaced with tail expression. All right, so that's what that second sentence means. And this first sentence uh, is also important. If one of the following expressions is in a tail context, then the sub-expressions shown as tail expression are in a tail context. All right, this is the inductive part. And we'll do a couple examples of this, or at least one or two, um, just to try to make that clear. That also, I think, um, confused me the first time I saw that. So let's look at if. We just looked at if a minute ago. Um, let's not look at the the one-armed if. This is called a one-armed if. Let's look at the two-armed if uh, above. This is, this is kind of like the standard if that people think about. The one-armed if below is used for when you want to have some sort of side effect like maybe signal an error or you print something out in a certain case, but you know, it's, it's not really functional um, in the way of functional programming. Scheme's a multi-paradigm language, so you, know, you don't have to program functionally in Scheme. But the one arm, oh, sorry, the two arm diff is what's uh, typical. And by the way, uh, I think Kent Divig told me at some point that uh, he redefines one arm diff uh, to make that illegal. So not only can you add syntax to Scheme, but you can redefine things um, and also, because of the library system, you can just not export things or not import things. Um, so this this one-armed if, if you're not careful, you can accidentally type it. So years ago, he showed how you know he, he could turn off the one-armed if or remove that from language. So the ability to remove things from a language, I think, is just as important as the ability to add things to a language, maybe even more important. And so you can you can do this. You can say, oh, we don't want one arm diff. It's too easy to make a mistake accidentally. And if you want to program functionally, well, the one arm diff you don't want. Okay, so here's the two uh, the two arm diff. And notice instead of like consequent or alternate or whatever, uh, now it says tail expression tail expression. So if expression this used to be test if expression tail expression tail expression. So. Um, the second and third expressions in the if are in tail context, and the first expression isn't. So let's just look at an if. So we can say if, how about, uh, I don't know, if three is less than um, two times four, then we're gonna return, you know, I'm just making up something. Cons cat onto the empty list. Uh, otherwise, we're going to return hash f. Okay, silly expression. We can evaluate it. We get the list cat. So, this is a not tail expression. The test is not a tail expression. Um, however, this is a tail expression. And this is a tail expression. Now, I should be a little careful here when I say these are tail expressions because if you read carefully what the spec is saying or the this report saying is saying that if the if expression itself occurs in a tail context, then these are tail expressions. Okay. 
And so let's look at what that means in a minute. But, you know, you can just think about it a little bit. Like I said, you can think about, well, if I knew, if I want to know what the value of the entire if is, if I knew what the value of the test expression is, would that tell me the value of the entire if? And the answer is no. Because if I know that this returns true, I still don't, I still have to evaluate whatever expression is in this position to know what the value of the entire if is. But if I have gotten to the point where I'm evaluating this expression, then I know I've already made my decision from the test expression. And so whatever the value is of this expression, that will be the value of the entire if. Okay. Then similar reasoning goes on for the second arm. So um, that's, that's one way to think about it. And, and like I said, this is related to the notion of continuations and all those good things. Um, now, but, but there's this really critical sentence again, which is, if one of the following expressions is in a tail context, then the sub-expressions shown as tail expression are in a tail context. Okay, so read this as if and only if. <laughs> okay, so if that's not true, if it is not true that one of the following expressions is in tail context, then then the sub-expressions shown as tail expression are not in tail context. That's the other way to think about this. Now, we already know that the last expression in the lambda is in tail context. So that's a tail expression. So if I put the if inside the lambda, then sure enough, that cons is is a tail expression. That is in tail context. And the reason is when this lambda gets evaluated and you know, or if it, you know, when the lambda gets evaluated and get a procedure back, if you were to call that procedure, the value of that call to the procedure would be the call to cons if you reach that cons expression. Okay, if we reach that cons expression and we evaluate it, whatever its value is, is the value of the entire call to the procedure. So let's just try calling uh, the lambda. I'm sorry, calling the procedure we get back from evaluating the lambda. Okay, and so we're going to give it some x, y, uh, z arguments. I don't know. Let's give it uh, 7, 8, 9. Okay, so we got back list cat, which came from that tail expression. Oh, right. However, however, if, I should be careful of the word if since I'm using an if, consider the case where we had another expression at the end. Maybe we're multiplying x by z, z. okay? So now for the overall lambda, this is that, that tail expression. This is the tail expression for the lambda. And this if would be just in the expression star position. Remember we had the expression star, you could have uh, zero or more expressions here. So what that means is not only is this expression not in uh, tail context anymore, Neither is the cons and neither is the hash f. Okay, so those are not in tail expressions, uh, tail, those are not in tail context anymore because the if itself isn't in tail context. And think of it this way. If we knew um, that we're evaluating this cons, okay, because the test uh, returned true, okay, well, we know what the value of the if is, but we don't know what the value of, of the procedure created from the lambda is. We don't we don't know what the value is because there's still this work that has to be done where we have to multiply x by z, okay? So it's this actually the multiplication of x by z, only when we know that value do we know what the value of the entire procedure call is, okay? And in fact, uh, there will be a call to cons of cat to the empty list here but we don't see that. We don't see that list. We just see the result of multiplying x by z. Okay. So um, even though within a single if that's at top level, let's say, that cons expression 
would be a tail expression. Um, that's not true if the if itself is not in tail, tail context. So that's, that's important. So you have to understand that when you're going through this. Um, similarly with con, which is, you know, like an if in a lot of ways, it's similar to an if. Um, and uh, case and 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 so forth. Let bindings, okay. Uh, let's just do let. Look, let's just do one more. Let's do let. So for let, which is equivalent to a lambda in an application, I could say something like let x be plus three four, and let y be times five six. And then the body of the let is plus x, y, let's say, okay? Now, if I look here, it says for let, there are actually two different forms of let, by the way. This is sometimes called a named let, or Dan Friedman calls this a let loop. Or we'll ignore that for a second. We'll, we'll get into it when we go through the report. Um, but we're dealing with this sort of let, where we have bindings, so variable to... Uh, the value of an expression bindings and then we have the body of the let and the body of the let is in tail context okay so these bindings so this this part's the bindings okay and so the way the let works is we evaluate in some unspecified order the plus three four and the, and the times five six and when we've evaluated those assuming we don't get an infinite loop or an error uh, then, you know, x gets the value on the right, and y gets this value on the right here. Uh, and then we evaluate the body expression with x being, in this case, 7, y being, in this case, 30. Then we evaluate this expression. So in an environment that's extended with these bindings. So once again, it's the same sort of reasoning. You know, if I'm evaluating this, this um, plus three, four, and I get seven back. Well, great, so I now know X is seven in the body, but that doesn't tell me anything about what the body of the let is gonna be. I still have to evaluate this body, okay? So I can evaluate all these bindings, binding expressions, and but I still have to do this last thing of evaluating the let. Now a let also, you know, allows me to have multiple things. So, so I can, uh, you know, I can go ahead and do all my begin type games, like I said, so I can display hello. And I can do another, you know, and I can do a new line. And I can do a, uh, you know, times x, y. Okay, I can do all those things. But the only, uh, the only expression that's in in tail context is this last one. So that is the tail expression for the let. Nothing else in the let is in tail expression, uh, the, in tail context. And uh, let's see here, can I do a define foo to be bar? Yep, okay. So I can have define. So remember we're allowed to have define, you know, definition star, and we're allowed to have, you know, expression star, uh, this type of thing. But at the very end, we have to have a single expression. That's the tail expression. And once again, even though that last tail, uh, expression is in tail context, well, that's only true if it's it's only true that that is a tail expression if the let is itself in tail context. So I could put the let inside of a lambda. I could put inside of another let. Actually, let's do that. This is kind of fun. So if I put this let that we've been playing around with inside another let in the body of that let, and I don't know, this could be z is uh, I don't know, two to the tenth power. All right. Uh, then. First of all, the inner let itself, the entire inner let is in tail position because it's you know, the last expression in the body of the let and also uh, the plus xy is, in, is, is a tail 
expression. Okay, great. But, but I could write my expression differently. I could change it around. I could say, well, let's, let's move the let. So now this let is actually the right-hand side of the binding to Z. Okay, so whatever let evaluates to, that's what the value of Z will be. And then, you know, maybe I'll just add, you know, Z to three, that kind of thing. So this plus XY is no longer a tail expression because when we know what the addition, you know, what, what the value of adding X and Y is, that doesn't tell us the value of the entire outer let expression, that just tells us what the value of Z is going to be. We still have to evaluate the body of that let expression, the outer let expression, to find find what that is. So this is contextual. What What is a tail expression that's contextual? So anyway, um, that's the idea here. That's the idea. And, and it has definitions of what a con clause and a case clause is, and a tail body, and a tail sequence, and all that sort of thing. Um, but that's how you read this, okay? Uh, and then certain built-in procedures must also perform tail calls. The first argument passed to apply and to call with current continuation, and the second argument passed to call with values must be called via a tail call. In the following example, the only tail call is the call to F. None of the calls to G or H are tail calls. The reference to X is in a tail context, but is not a tail, uh, not a call, and therefore is not a tail call. All right, we'll look at that expression in a second. Note, implementations may recognize that some non-tail calls, such as in the call to H above, such as the call to H above, can be evaluated as though they were tail calls. Okay, so now the implementation has choice um, as to how it's going to do it. In the example above, the let expression could be compiled as a tail call to H. My guess is Shea Scheme would do this. The possibility of H, or at least sometimes, the possibility of H returning an unexpected number of values can be ignored because in that case, the effect of the let is explicitly unspecified and implementation dependent. Okay, so this is interesting. You know, we'll, we'll look at, we'll try to understand what's going on here. So here, um, I, I think I basically understood everything up to this point. Here it's getting a little tricky. Uh, maybe it's not tricky, but uh, I'm going to have to think a little. But I, I think it's interesting, this note. So so now we're getting into part of how R6RS works, this implementation dependent, where an implementation can choose or not to choose, not choose to do something with H that's a little smarter. Um, and then the other thing is now we're talking about the effect of the let is explicitly unspecified and implementation dependent. Okay, so we're getting into the notion of multiple values. So scheme allows the expression to return zero, one, or multiple values. And you also have a context that return that expects a certain number of values. So we're starting to get into the, to that issue. And it turns out that um, some of this behavior is unspecified intentionally by the specification and it depends on the implementation. So, you know, there's sort of like C where there is unspecified behavior. If your program has unspecified behavior, the implementation can do whatever it wants. You know, go an infinite loop or signal an error or return 42, whatever. Um, that's why I believe it's uh, the case for R6. Well, we'll look at that. I mean, it is explicitly, uh, the, the report explicitly talks about what it means to be unspecified behavior, but that's my understanding is that the implementation can do whatever. Um, okay. So this part's a little tricky. Mm. Well, let's just take a look at this expression. Okay. Let's just try to break it down here. Let's just take a look at this expression. See if the copy and paste actually works or causes trouble. First of all, this run, yeah, it runs. Okay, so we have a lambda. That lambda has one expression in it 
which is an if. So because we only have one expression, this expression is in tail context. This if is a, um, that's a tail expression. Okay, so let's look at the if itself. So the if has a test, which is not in tail position. And then it has the, um, was it the, the consequent and the alternate? These are both in tail position. Um, so here we have a let. So this let is in tail position. This called H is not in tail position because as we said, you know, the bindings are not in tail position. Um, this reference to X is in tail position. So if we know what the value of X is, if we reach that part of the program evaluation, we know what the entire procedure's value is for that procedure call to the procedure we get back that takes no arguments from the Lambda. And uh, we also have an AND expression. <clears throat> okay, so AND gets evaluated left or right, it's short circuit. Um, and it turns out that if there's ever a true value, if there's ever an expression that returns a, a uh, sorry, if there's ever an expression for and, if there's ever an expression that returns a false value, which is hash f in scheme is the only false value, then the and short circuits. Otherwise, the value of the and, if all the ex expressions return a true value, that is any value other than hash f, um, then the, the value of the overall and expression is the value of the last sub-expression. Okay, that's the and semantics. Okay, so, so this and is in tail position. Um, all right, we, we should look at the and and see how it's described. So if this call to G, let me think about this. So if the call to G returns hash F, then there's nothing more to be done, but that's actually in a test position. That's in a test position because you still have to decide yeah, you still have to make a decision based on the value. So I think the only expression here that's actually in tail position is this call to F. I think that call is a tail call. Uh, see if I understand correctly. So first of all, is there something here about and? Uh, what does it say for and? Okay, yeah, that's right. And expression star and then tail expression. So only the last expression and is a tail expression and the same with or. Okay, so I was right about that, great. Um, okay, so let's, what is the description here? In the following example, the only tail call is the call to F. Okay, well that's the last thing in the and. Okay, that is a tail call, that's right, because um, this X, this reference to X, that is, an expression in tail position, but is not a call, it's not a procedure call. So it's not a tail call. Okay, so that is, uh, that is correct, this first sentence. Okay, that makes sense to me. I, I think I completely understand that. The second sentence, none of the calls to G or H are tail calls. Well, let's look at the calls to G and H. Okay, so this call to, to G is in the test position of the if. And so even though the if is itself in tail context, it's, a, it's the last expression in the body of a lambda, the call to G is in the test position of the if, you know, you need to know what G is gonna return, and then you either evaluate the let and the or the and. Okay, so uh, if you're doing it by hand, let's say. So, so that call to G is not in tail position, that's fine. And remember, this is a syntactic property you know, okay, so just inductively, it's not in the tail position. Uh, what about the call to H? Okay, so there's another call to G. This call to G also is not in tail position because only the last expression in an AND is in uh, tail context. Uh, and then this call to H also is not in, in tail context because it is part of, uh, it's the right-hand side of a binding, okay? So that is not tail context. Uh, the reference to X is in tail context. That's right, the body of the let. Okay, so this, by the way, um, let me see if I can get my pointer. This is not a reference to X. This is where the binding for X is being you know, defined. Um, so here we're binding X. This is like a, you know, we're, we're saying what the, this, we're introducing uh, a new lexical, you know, variable 
that's going to have this value. Okay, so we're setting up the binding for it, um, but the the uh, reference to x is is this. This is a variable reference. So as a reference to x, uh, but it's not a call, so it's not a tail call. But that is the x is in tail expression. Okay, note. So this is the important thing. Implementations may recognize that some non-tail calls, such as the call to h, okay, so we're talking about that thing right there, can be evaluated as though they were tail calls. In the example above, the let expression could be compiled as a tail call to h. The possibility of h returning an unexpected number of values can be ignored because in that case, the effect of the let is explicitly unspecified and implementation dependent. Okay, so, so this also tells you something important about Scheme. In Scheme, if you're trying to, to reason about whether or not a certain program transformation or optimization is sound, if it's like legal, you have to think about things like the fact that Scheme expressions can return multiple values or zero values, in addition to things like the interaction of call CC or call with current continuation with set bang, that sort of thing. So uh, there's the notion of correctness preserving transformations. If you want to transform this expression to another expression that's maybe more efficient to evaluate, you want to make sure that that expression transformation is correctness preserving, that you preserve the correct behavior, but you also have to worry about error preserving behavior. So if there was an error, if it, if it was required for an implementation to signal an error with one expression and you transform it and no longer would that error be required to be signaled um, in the new expression, then you know you've you've changed the behavior of the program. So you want your pro your program transformations not just to be correctness preserving but also error preserving. Okay, so I think I understand what's going on here now that I've read this. Um, okay, so let's take a look at this expression again. You know, let's just look at the let itself, actually, because the let's in tail position, so, so or tail context. So we can just look at the let itself. Uh, we can pull that out. Um, all right, so what, what's going on here? The value of this called h is being, you know, bound to this, this uh, variable x. And then the value of the entire let expression is just x itself. So we're saying, okay, we're, gonna, we're giving a name x to the value of h, and then we're just immediately returning x. So the point is, well, we could do that, but we could just equivalently, we could just return, I mean, we could replace, or a compiler could replace that entire expression with just the call to h, because it doesn't matter that we gave it, a, gave the value of h a name, the calling h a name, um, you know, the only point of that, you know, we just, we give uh, the, the call to H, the value, uh, the name X, and then we just return, you know, that variable X. So that is ex equivalent to just calling H. Okay, that's the claim. So it, uh, that note is saying that it's okay for an implementation of scheme to do this sort of transformation. Um, it could say, hey, you know, this let binding is kind of pointless. Let's just go ahead and and uh, transform that into this, and then this could be a tail call. So now the call to H can be a tail call. Okay, it could be treated as if it were a tail call. Syntactically, it's not a tail call in the original expression, but you can optimize it. The compiler, for example, could do an optimization and treat it as a tail call, and now you know the memory usage of your program is better uh, in terms of the stack usage, for example. Okay, so that's a nice transformation. The tricky part here was, is this, um, so, so we have a parenthetical inside of a note, okay? So we're getting into the weeds a little bit, but this is where the fun part is actually. The possibility of H returning an unexpected number of values can be ignored because in that case, the effect of the let is explicitly unspecified and implementation dependent. All right. Well, let's talk about values for just a second because otherwise it, you know, it's hard to talk about this. There, there is something called values. Actually, let's see what values is. So values is a procedure, so we can tell it's a procedure uh, called values. So we can call it. We can call values with no arguments. Yeah, seems pretty boring. We can call values with one argument, like uh, plus three, four, get back seven. 
we can call values with multiple arguments. Uh, okay, now it's a little hard to tell at the, the REPL, the read eval print loop, but what's actually going on here is that we're getting back one, two, or three different um, different values. This is different than building up a list. We're not returning a list of, of values. We're just, we're actually, um, you know, producing different number of values. And I can show this because I can do list of values um, plus three, four. Okay, so now I got a list back seven with seven in it. If I do a list of values with no arguments, like an exception, return zero values to single value return context. Okay, so um, list is a procedure and it expects that that expression being evaluated will return a single uh, answer or a single value. It's not gonna return multiple values, it's not gonna return zero values. Um, similarly, if we did values with multiple, uh, multiple values returned, we get an error saying return two values to single value return context. Okay, so that's just not allowed. However, there is something called let values. There's also call with values. So here we could say, let's see if I remember the syntax, uh, we can say like x, y, z is uh, values of plus, you know, I'll just make it two. Um, uh, plus three, four times five, six. And then uh, choo -choo -choo. we can have multiple um, let values bindings. Um, but now let's just say we'll have a list of X and Y. Okay. So, so let values is kind of like let, except it allows us to um, accept, you know, to, to have bindings in a context that accepts multiple values or, or zero values. Um, I think, I think we can do a zero values version of this, unless uh, three, four. And so we can do values with no arguments. Let's see if this works. Yep. And, uh, you know, we could also do single value, whatever, but in any case, this allows us to return multiple values to a context that expects that, or return zero values to a context that expects it. Why would you want this in the language? Mm, there are a few few reasons. So sometimes it's a nice abstraction. You know, sometimes you don't want to return anything from an expression. Sometimes you want to return multiple things, and it is true you could package up those things in a list, but Values gives you a different type of abstraction. Like uh, um, when writing a compiler, for example, sometimes when in the compiler, you want to return two different values that mean different things. It's not, a, you know, these aren't lists of things that go together. These are totally different things. Um, so values gives you that abstraction. The other thing is values can be implemented in such a way where there, there aren't lists being allocated. So if you do a call to cons or list, uh, that requires you know, allocating memory, whereas a call to values uh, could be passed, you know, those values could be stored in registers in the CPU without, uh, you know, doing heap allocation, for example. Um, and it could be, pa uh, it could be super fast. So if the compiler wants to, or the implementation wants to, they could do, uh, handle these values in a way that's, that's very fast. But um, anyway, it's just an abstraction that Scheme provides and also allows implementers to be fancy if they want. Um, you know, we could, I mean, let's just, you know, I know this is a little bit of an aside, but you know, this is kind of all aside, you know, so let's, let me just see, uh, let's see, could we see this somehow? Okay. Let's try this. So, um, so here's what we had before. Okay. Versus if I do a let, okay. Um, of a list and try to see if I can compare these somehow. And it's a little tricky to compare them exactly. Mm. Well, so here I'm allocating a list though. I don't want to do that. So maybe what I could do 
Um, what if I just add them? Okay, let me add those values. Uh, first, yeah, let's. Now I have to do cars and cutters. I mean, I guess this is getting to why you don't, <laughs> why you may not want to do it. Like now, now I have a list um, of these things, but now I have to take like cars and cutters or catters or whatever if I want to manipulate what's in there. Uh, so I could do like that, you know. Um, but now, now I've gotten into building lists and taking them apart, uh, that kind of thing. And so, you know, we could try doing some things like calling time just to see if this, um... okay, so let's see if I, I think these things are so fast that, unless I forgot a quote, um, no, I think I left, I think the quote is right. Uh, let's see if there's any. Mm, that's interesting. So no bytes allocated. So that that called list, I don't know, maybe that's um okay, so so there is okay, so if we're gonna go down the rabbit hole, may as well. May as well go down the rabbit hole. Um uh, where's my magic? Where's my magic? Oh, I think I know where my magic is. Okay, here is the magic incantation. I can enter in the Shea scheme. So I can see at least the intermediate language assembly. I don't know if this is really going down to the full assembly or not. Uh, I know different versions of Shea scheme may have done this differently, but let's take a look at that. Okay, and you can see what's going on. Mm, so someone someone who's a whiz at assembly maybe wants to look at this and and try to compare this and you know there's a nice exercise actually see if you can see what the difference is uh, let's go back to the one with values okay uh, I don't know if the assembly's shorter or different but if you really wanted to get into it you know you would you could go and compare the assembly and see what the assembly looks like. Okay, so here's um, doo -doo -doo. Values. okay. Uh, compare, branch not equal, move, jump, uh, my location. Well, you know, here are tools to at least explore and try to see see if you can figure out what's what's going on. Um, uh, seems like there was no allocation going on for the, the version with list either. So I don't know if she's, uh, being smart about this. And, um, you know, the, the other thing we could do is try expanding. Okay, so let me, let me turn off the magic right now. Uh, let's see if we turn off the magic, where's the magic? I'll turn that to hash F. Okay, um, so instead of doing a time, let's do an expand. Okay, and let's do a print gensim hash chef. Make it a little easier to read. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what the let values. Okay, so I told you there's something called call with values. This Hash 2% means it's a build-in. Mm, let's see, where's the other one? Okay, let's expand this. Hmm. Okay, let's list. So it is calling list. Hmm. All right, I don't know if uh, CP0, which is the, the optimizer, is somehow getting rid of that or just you know it looks like it's doing some allocation with the call to list but maybe maybe uh, Shay's being smart or or the counts off for a few bytes I'm not sure uh, when it's calling time 
or maybe I goofed it. Let me, let me just try one more thing. So if I do time with it quoted, I don't think that's right because I think that's just going to give us back the list. Yeah, okay. So that just gives us back the list. So I, I was right to not quote it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think you can play around with these and you know maybe we can get one of the Shea experts to, to help us understand this a little better. Uh, but that... There you go. You get this call by value. You get the lambda. So there's some allocation right there because you get this lambda. Um, that could give you some allocation. Case lambda. All right. Uh, anyway, you could see we can keep going deeper to try to understand this issue and try to understand how Shea implements it. And you know, Shea Shea is uh, open source, so you could conceivably at least figure out what Shea is doing here. Although maybe it's not so easy to figure it out. Um, but uh, going back to the values, okay, so let's not get too distracted on our snipe hunt. Um, so like I said, you know, we can, we can have multiple values in the scheme. So, so we're, we're talking about the context of a function called h. So I could say define, I mean, uh, yeah, define h. Let's just try to set up an example where you could have a problem. So I'm going to say lambda, you know, nil so that h took no arguments and i could say values one two three okay so this calls to h will return three values and so that means if you're going to call h it has to be in a context uh if you want to get you know if you don't want to have an error or something like that or unspecified behavior you're going to have to call h in a context that um expects three error, uh three Results. So we could do a call with values or let values. So we could say let values uh, x, y, z, call to h, and then, you know, I don't know, like, like let's add x, y, z. Okay, there we go. But if I did like list of, of h, then I get an error, I get an exception. Okay. And similarly, if I do it like, okay, so here's the question. If I say, um, let V be the call, the call to H, and then I'm going to return V. Okay. So what happens? Um, well, in this case, uh, Shea returned one, two, three. Okay, the possibility of H returning an unexpected number of values can be ignored because in that case, the effect of the let is explicitly unspecified and implementation dependent. If I'm understanding this note correctly, and someone who knows the spec really well um, hopefully can correct me on this if I'm wrong, uh, if that's true, because that's the only use of H, then I think what they're saying is that this expression that I just wrote the behavior of it is unspecified. That that um, and it's, it's implementation dependent. So as soon as we write something that's unspecified, the implementation can do whatever it want, what whatever it wants. That's my interpretation of this. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, so if you're if you're an R six expert, uh, please correct me. <clears throat> so the other part of this that I know that we're, what, an hour and 18 minutes in. We haven't answered the question. I still don't know what a proper tail call is, but starting to figure out what a tail call is. All right. Uh, that sounds like there's going to be a part two of this video, okay? All right, so there's this other thing about certain built-in procedures must also perform tail calls. The first argument passed to apply and to call with current continuation, and the second argument passed to call with values must be called via tail call. Okay. Uh, so apply. Let's look at apply. So apply lets us, you know, apply a function to arguments that are packaged up. Um, like, you know, so, so if we wanted to add, you know, three, four, five, great. We can do it that way. But what if what if the arguments were packaged up as a list? You know, what the numbers were packaged as a list? Okay, so we can't do this because because uh, plus doesn't expect a list; it expects numbers. So we can use apply, 
All right, there we go. And we can also, let's see, I think we can do that. No, it's not a proper list. Oh, the last argument has to be a list, that's it. Three, four, five, I, I never use apply in practice. And nine, okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, so uh, apply lets you do this sort of thing. It says the first argument plus pass to apply must be called via a tail call. Must be called via a tail call. First argument pass to apply. Okay, so the first argument. Ah, I see. So the first argument is going to be, you know, the procedure argument. Now, of course, we could have an expression. It doesn't just have to be a, a variable that results through a procedure. It could be something like you know, car of list plus. Okay, that works as well. Okay, so this first expression in a file, in apply better evaluate to a procedure. Uh, and in fact, a procedure that, you know, can take these, uh, these arguments we're about to pass it. Um, and so that, I think what, what it's saying is when, when plus, which is the value of this, is called with these arguments, it's going to be a tail call. So even though um, we're inside, you know, the, the, this expression is within the call to apply, um, we can we can be sure that when plus itself is called with all these arguments, uh, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that the call to plus will be a, a tail call. Okay, so that's that's specifying something about the behavior of apply, how apply has to be implemented. Uh, so if you're if you were implementing scheme and you had a definition of apply or implementation of apply that didn't ensure that the plus in this case, um, the call to plus was in in a tail context or, or it was a tail call, then that implementation would be wrong, is how I'm interpreting it. And similarly with call current continuation and also the second argument to call with values. Okay, must be called via tail call. Okay. All right, so there are some restrictions there. Um, and it looks like these are the only restrictions. Okay, so it looks like apply, call with current continuation, and call with values, because they don't specify anything else, so those have to be tail calls. Great. Um, okay, so that I think I've got a handle on. Uh, this I think I've got a handle on, you know, the con... It's kind of wordy, but it's the same sort of idea as an if. It's just the syntax is a little more complicated. We already looked at the hand, and we already looked at let, um, and begin, and lambda. Okay, so that's that's the notion of a tail call. And if we want to understand what a proper tail call is, then we are referred to this paper, which is 12 pages, including the um, references. And, uh, you know, uh, let me just show you one more thing. So I'm not gonna get into the paper with this video because I need a break, um, to be honest. But let me just show you uh, something that's useful and maybe helps visualize uh, what's going on with the tail calls also. So let's define factorial. Um, this is like a standard, standard little recursive function. You can do sub one in, or I can do n minus one. Okay, so this is. Standard factorial definition. And so I can do factorial of five and I get 120, all right? So let's just look at um, these expressions. Well, I mean, we can get into this more, but so we have a lambda, okay. So the outer define, you know, that's a definition. It's not an expression, but this whole, you know, define is, is at the top level, you know, um, there's nothing outside of it. Okay, so we have here we have a lambda, 
we know that the last expression in lambda is in tail context. Okay, so this cond is in tail context. And then, you know, we have two clauses. The first clause, this is sort of like an if where you have a test and then the consequent, otherwise the alternate. Okay, so here's the test for the first con clause. That is not in tail position. Syntactically, that's not in tail position. And also, if you just think about it, um, if we know that n is zero, we still don't know what the value of the cond is. We still have to do more work. We have to evaluate the expression on the right. And if we know that n is not zero, we have to go to the else. So, you know, we still have more work to do is one way to think about it. But the one, is, that expression is in um, tail context. That is a tail expression. It's not a tail call because it's not a procedure call, but that's in tail context. You know, well, if we get to the point where you have a one, that's it. That whole con is a one. That whole lambda is a one. The value of the lambda, the procedure, you know. Uh, we always have to keep in mind that this is a lambda expression, and when it's evaluated, that gives you back a procedure that takes one argument in this case. Okay, so here, let's look at the else clause of the con. So there's not really a test here. The else is sort of like the false I'm sorry, the uh, fall through, right? That's sort of like putting a hash T here. It's like, yeah, this always holds if the other tests uh, all failed, got um, evaluated to hash F. So look, we've got a call. That call is in tail position. This is a tail call or tail context. Uh, so this is a tail call in tail context. And so we have a call to times in tail context. Um, Great. Now, but look at this call. Here we got another call. <laughs> okay. So we have a, a recursive call to factorial. This is not in tail context. This is not in tail context. So um, this is, you know, an argument to uh, an outer procedure call. Um, and so we, we haven't done the multiplication yet. So where is that, where is it said, by the way? Um, did we even talk about that? Where did it get into uh, that whole thing? Let's see if we can find in the spec where it... Where does it talk about procedure calls? And arguments to procedure calls. A tail call is a procedure call that occurs in a tail context. Tail contexts are defined inductively. Okay. I guess um, maybe it's just because they don't say uh, that that's a... I don't see anything here. Is there a case for procedure application? I don't see a case for procedure application, especially. Hmm. Okay, so it may be that it's just because it's left out. Um, but in any case, uh, this expression, this, this call is not a tail call. And you can also think about it in terms of not just syntactic inductive definition, but okay, if you know what the value of that recursive call is, you don't know what the value of the entire cond is because you still have to multiply that value by n. Okay? Uh, so that's not a tail call. And neither is this... Uh, call this a, a minus. All right, we can trace this definition. Okay, and if I, if I uh, call factorial five, we can see this nice trace where not only do we see each call, but the indentation level of the call shows you that, that, that the stack is growing that the call stack is growing. So you can see this triangular shaped recursion. And then when the values start being returned, then we're popping values off the stack. We're just popping frames off the stack. So this sort of triangular shape is when you have non, non tail calls being made. Okay. Um, now we can define another version of factorial, which uses what's called accumulator passing style. Um, fact APS. And that's going to take n as a number, and it's going to take a, which is an accumulator. Great. We can say if uh, n 
is zero. We're going to return the accumulator. Else, this is the important part. Okay. Importantly, the recursive call to factorial APS is a tail call. It is in tail context. Okay. It is true that this call to subtraction or to, to, to minus is not a tail call and this call to times is not a tail call, but those, um, those happen right away in a way. So it's like, yeah, they'll use a little bit of stack space maybe, but then they're immediately going to return. Um, whereas the recursion, you know, here we have unbounded recursion potentially. If it turns out if n is uh, negative, this recursion never finishes, it's an infinite loop. So we could have an unbounded amount of stack space. Um, so this is what we call a serious call. And uh, this is what's a simple call. So we have a serious call, but the serious call is in tail position. Great. Now let's trace. Okay, so first of all, how do we call this thing? Well, we call fact uh, APS and say start, give a starting accumulator value. Okay, so I get 120. But now we can trace the define. Actually, I'll show you another way to trace. We can trace, let's see if I remember you have to put a quote or not. I, yeah, okay. All right, so now we're, tr oh, whoops. Uh, I don't want to trace, I want to trace uh, fact APS. That's the one I want to trace, okay. So let's call fact APS and notice that you can see the arguments changing in the recursion and the accumulator growing. But notice that we don't have the triangular shape anymore. Notice that that we're using a constant amount of stack space. The, the depth is constant. And if we compare that, remember, to the other version where we have the triangle shaped recursion, okay, we can see that the depth doesn't grow. And if I really want to drive the point home, let's try putting in a negative number. So this is an infinite recursion. Whoa, okay, I'm going to stop. And you could see this negative number through the multiplications is growing to be really big. Actually, we run out of memory eventually because the negative number will get really big. But notice we still have, haven't have increased the stack depth at all. Okay. Um, we could also try this with, okay, I'm going to try to live dangerously here. Let's try it with just the regular factorial for minus one. That's also an infinite loop. Okay, so um, if I go back here, okay. So it looks, it might have looked for a second like it was the stack depth wasn't getting deeper. But what was actually happening is once the, the depth reached 10, you know, it um, gave the shorthand because, uh, you know, it was going off the screen, basically. So we got up to 980 stack frames of depth before he stopped. So if you've heard of a stack overflow, you know, that's the sort of the situation where you get a stack overflow. In Shay's scheme, the stack is actually implemented in the heap and it can keep growing. And so as long as you've got lots of RAM, like my machine has 64 gigs of RAM, you could have gigantic stacks. That's not a problem. Um, but the point is it is going to use unbounded amount of stack space. Like I said, in both cases, actually, even in the tail recursive version, uh, eventually you run out of memory because the numbers will get so big. But you could also write a tail recursive function where you didn't have something growing, like numbers getting bigger. And they could, you know, that's basically just like a little infinite loop. It'll just keep running and uh, uses a bounded amount of stack space. Okay, so that is um, about tail calls and what it means to be a tail call and to be in tail context, those sorts of things. What does it mean to be properly tail, uh, to be a proper tail call uh, versus a tail call? Okay, so we still haven't gotten to that one. Um, proper tail recursion and space efficiency. Uh, we were referred by the report to this paper. And so we're gonna have to read the paper. 
Uh, so that will be an adventure where we read the paper, try to understand what the formal definition is. It looks like there are some statistics and benchmarks. And you know, like I said, PLDI is benchmark. You got to have benchmarks. It looks like some syntactic definitions and uh, some continuation rules, uh, reduction rules. All right. Well, uh, oh. okay. Wow. <laughs> All right. So it's the first chink in the armor, right? <laughs> you really want to know what a proper, proper tail call is? Well, you, you read this paper, um, so, yeah, I'll have to think about that. I guess I, I could, we could probably try to go into this paper. Um, I don't know how hard it's going to be. It looks a little, it looks a little subtle. Uh, maybe we can at least try to figure out what the definition is for proper tail recursion, even if we don't go into, you know, the the, the real details. So um, that's fine. But you know, we're already an hour and a half in. Um, so at least we talked about tail calls and hopefully I don't have to talk about just that part of tail contacts and tail calls again. So we've covered that part of the report. Uh, still have to figure out what proper tail recursion is. If someone's got a nice explanation, um, great. I'm all ears. Um, well, anyway, hopefully that was interesting. If not, oh, well, this is supposed to be boring. You know, we're just going through the spec. Um, and uh, well, Next time, I'll either go through this paper or go through more of the spec. Well, thank you for the question. Bye-bye.